All right, as I always do before these Heathkit test equipment documentaries, I'm going to start out with Chuck Pinson's excellent book, Heathkit Test Equipment Products. Now the first thing I'm going to do, because this is a function generator that I'm looking at, I'm going to flip to the section on function generators, if I can get to it. Function and pulse generators. There is only a few models in this very short chapter. One of them is the IG1271, which is a basic function generator. Sine, square, and triangle waveforms made from 1974 to 1987. I had one of these, but got rid of it. Perfectly good instrument. My major complaint with it was that it did not have any offset control. A lot of times I wanted to offset the output uh, above you know, zero volts or ground or below or and this did not have provision for an offset and that was something I really missed. I replaced this with a uh, Hewlett Packard uh, function generator that that had that functionality. Also the the knob here for adjustment of the frequency was very small and it was very difficult to dial in the frequency accurately. Otherwise it was a fine piece of equipment. Then there's the IG1273, which is a big bruiser of a function generator, but not really all that fancy otherwise, but it does have a great big knob, and it does have the uh, uh, layout of a more professional piece of equipment. And then a similar piece of equipment with a linear or a logarithmic sweep function pretty nice looking piece of kit. And then another one which I still have, and maybe I'll do a video on it one of these days, is the IG1277 Pulse Generator. But you may ask, as I did, is this all the function generators that Heathkit had? I know it's not, but why are there only four models in the function generator chapter? Well that is apparently, if it didn't say audio in the title, then it got put in a different chapter generically listed as audio equipment. This has audio analyzers, audio frequency meters, but then we get into sine and square wave audio generators, which are function generators. Uh, they just don't have a triangle wave output, but otherwise it's the same darn thing. So it's a mystery to me why uh, these are ordered in this particular chapter instead of in the function generator chapter. So I'm going to now focus on this particular subcategory of equipment, the sine slash square wave audio generators. All right, this gets a little tricky because of the way the models are not just lined up in a nice linear progression from one to another. So Heathkit had independent sine wave generator or audio sine wave generator product line they also had a square wave generator product line and at various points they sort of merged and separated and so on so it's really difficult to just say well this came after this or so and so was a remodel or an advanced version of the previous one um, I'm gonna do my best to describe the lineage of these things so the the first one that Heathkit had was the G2 this was a sine square wave audio generator. It was the fourth piece of equipment that Heathkit had in their test equipment product line. So very early on for them. It came out in 1948 and was made up to 1951. It provides output coverage from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz using a simple RC circuit. Uh, probably the distortion wasn't that great but it says here that uh, sine wave distortion was less than 1%, so not horrible. The G2 was refined, not exactly replaced, but refined by the AG7 right here, which came out in the same year that the G2 was discontinued. So you could treat it as a replacement but it's not just a re uh, cosmetic refurbishment, it's a, uh, an electronic refinement of the G2. 
And this was only made for one year, 1957 to 1952. It produces better square waves and has a high low impedance control. It uses more precise resistors, half percent resistors in the oscillator circuit. Uh, generate sine waves from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with a multiplier instead of just doing it all with a knob. Um, after the one year, the AG7 was turned into the A07, so they changed what they were calling these things. Or not the A07, the A01. So that's this product here. Looks a lot like this, except they've moved some of the knobs around. The uh, AO1 came was produced from 1952 to 1957, and it is considered to be a refinement of the AG7. It produces both sine and square waves, but does it with more precision in terms of the shape. The top end is still only 20 kilohertz. The AO1 was in turn replaced by the AG10, right next door to it on the page, and you can see that it is an awful lot like it, although there are more knobs. This came out in 1957 and was made for a few years up until 1962. It produces both sine and square waves and represented a major improvement over the AO1 expanding the frequency coverage all the way up to 1 megahertz from the earlier products uh, 20 kilohertz, so a dramatic increase in range. It was not, it says it's an audio generator, but because the frequency goes up so high, it's, it's more than that. The AG-10 was replaced by the IG-82, which came out in 1962 and was made until 1969. It's a cosmetic upgrade of the AG-10. So no electronic change, it's just a restyling of the uh, case slash cabinet to have it line up with the new look of the products. This was made from 62 to 69. In 1969, it was replaced by the IG-18, which is the subject of this video. And this is in yet another Heathkit styling change, a more dramatic one here, where they went to this type of uh, cabinet with a clamshell top and bottom and the side rails with handles on them. A lot of different pieces of equipment were made in, with this styling. So the IG-18 came out in 1969 and was made up until 1977. It was similar to the IG-72, which was a concurrent product, and that's in a different lineup that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Uh, it was similar in respect to the fact that the frequency was switch-selected Instead of just turning a knob to uh, get the frequency you wanted off of a, a scale on the front of the equipment, you had a sec uh, succession of knobs here that selected different aspects like the units and the tens and the hundreds, or I think it was two digits, and then a range switch, and then a fine-tuning uh, potentiometer that lets you dial in smaller than the least significant um, selector knob up here. So it was a change in the way you entered the frequency and it made for a more precise frequency output. So in that sense it was similar to the IG-72 because they both used switch selection of frequency and they were sold by, side by side at least up until 1976. So I'll come back, circle back around to the IG-72 later. In 1977 the IG-18 was replaced by the IG-5218, so that was something that Heathkit was doing around that time, rebranding older equipment with a new color scheme and different knobs, but otherwise leaving them just the same. So this one went from the beige color of the uh, 
IG-18 to the blue and eggshell white coloration that was typical of the later Heathkit test equipment. So again, this came out in 1977, was sold up to 1985. It was not replaced. This was at the end of Heathkit's uh, test equipment lineup, so they weren't coming out with new models of any substance. In a way, the only replacement for the IG-5218 was the IG-5282, which was this sort of beginner's workbench product that in no way replaces this. This takes you back to the earliest models in the sense that it's a, a very limited frequency range, 10 hertz to 100 kilohertz. It does do sine and square wave, but there's uh, just a range switch and then a single sweep potentiometer, very low accuracy. And amplitude is just done by twisting the shaft of the potentiometer, different amplitude for both sine and square waves, different jacks, and they're not even banana proper banana binding posts, they're just uh, cheap jacks like this whole sub-series of equipment that was bargain priced for beginners. So in that sense the 5218 and the IG-18 were the last of the sine square wave audio generators in Heath's lineup. Now let's go back to the SQ-1. This is an orphan product. The SQ-1 here came out in 1951 and was made up to 1959. It didn't turn into some other product. It was really just a product all by itself. This was just a square wave generator. Whereas the other things Heathkit had were sine and square wave generators together or just sine wave generators. Uh, this is their only square wave only generator product. It was designed to provide cleaner square waves over a wider frequency range than the AG7, which was made, came out at least around the same time. So, but it wasn't continued with anything else. Its features got merged into other products. Now let's go to the sine wave only products. The AG8 was an early sine wave only audio generator. Came out in 1952, was made up to 1959. It had more accurate sine waves than the models that came before, of which there were not too many. And this didn't exactly get rolled into another model, really. Its design got rolled into the AG-10 that we've already looked at. But the AG-10 was a sine square wave, but at least the circuit philosophy and the specifications were similar. Meanwhile, we had the AG-9, which was also a sine wave audio generator, but it's, again, sort of an orphan product. It didn't come out of an earlier model. It was just designed by itself, apparently. It was made in two versions, the original AG-9 and then the AG-9A, spanning from 1955 to 1962. significance of this one was that it was I think their first version that used the selector switches to select a units and a tens and a range multiplier and then a fine tuning vernier control to set the frequency. So in that sense this was the beginning of that philosophy within the Heathkit lineup. And it was given a cosmetic upgrade in 1962 Taking over from the AG-9, you can see that it's really the same thing, just with a different color scheme and different style knobs. So it's a cosmetic upgrade with no circuit change. So that was produced from 1962 to 76. It was outmoded by the IG-18, again the subject of this video, and its follow on the IG-5218. So this covers all of the models that Heathkit made and now I'm going to focus on the subject of this video, the IG-18. As it says about it here, it was similar to the earlier IG-72 with respect to the switch selection of frequency 
and general specifications, and the two models were sold side by side until 1976. The major difference was that the IG-18 added square waves, whereas the IG-72 was um, sine wave only. The frequency selection was done by two significant digits, so two knobs for those two significant digits, plus a 0 to 1 vernier and a multiplier that gave you times 1, times 10, times 100, and times 1000 of whatever you selected with the other controls. Accuracy is plus or minus 5%, so not great. The sine wave, that's the frequency accuracy rather, not the waveform. The sine wave output goes all the way from 1 hertz to 100 kilohertz. Voltage output in 8 ranges from 0 0.003 to 10 volts RMS full scale with a 10 kilo ohm or higher external load. The output indication is done with uh, two voltage scales and a decibel scale on a meter. So when you're adjusting the amplitude of your signal, you can read its amplitude with reasonable accuracy off the meter. Meter accuracy, however, is only plus or minus 5% of full scale, assuming you have a proper load termination. The circuit in here was designed to have a termination of 600 ohms. If you are not going into a 600 ohm load, then the meter doesn't accurately read the amplitude of the signal. And I should um, mention or further clarify that the meter only applies to the sine wave output, not to the square wave output, which has fewer uh, amplitude selections. The square wave output goes from 5 hertz to 100 kilohertz with voltage ranges um, peak to peak of 0.1, 1 and 10 volts and they're, they're assuming a 2000 ohm or higher load. So if you're going back to the sine wave output with its output terminals, it's expecting a 600 ohm load at least to get the meter to be accurate. If you have a different impedance load higher or lower, then the meter is no longer accurate for reading the amplitude of the sine wave. They make that easier in a way by putting in a switch that allows selecting an internal 600 ohm load. And you can engage that and then the meter's happy and you can adjust your amplitude and then if you don't want to have that 600 ohm internal load, you can switch it back out of the circuit. Of course, if you're feeding into a 600 ohm load, then you don't need this switch, but at least they put it in there so you can still use the meter to adjust even when you're not going into a 600 ohm load. And for most testing of the things that this was designed for, for example, testing the frequency response or the distortion characteristics of a piece of equipment such as an audio amplifier, it's not really important what the load is because you're looking for relative changes you know, decibels, for example, instead of absolute voltages. So here is the uh, artifact itself, an IG-18 that I purchased on eBay after waiting quite some time for one to show up. And this one had been refurbished by the uh, person who sold it on eBay. I think he has a business or a hobby of refurbishing and selling uh, old test equipment, and seems to have done a nice job, saved me the work of refurbishing it myself. However, he did some weird things like replace the screws with some really weird looking screws, and he repainted the top and bottom of the case with a kind of an eggshell white that just did not look like the color went with the the light beige or tan of the uh, of the front panel. It should have a somewhat contrasting color that at least is complimentary and it did not it looked just funny um, so I stripped the paint off and repainted it and I'll be putting those back on this particular instrument uh, is of significance to me those who've watched my series of videos on vintage Heathkit test equipment may know that one of the first ones I did was on one of their power supplies and I'd mentioned at the time that that was something I'd obtained and restored because when I was a teenager, um, 
I was signed up for the electronics class that was going to be offered for the first time in my high school and I went in and built a lot of the test equipment in the summer before the classes were going to start being offered and the power supply was one of the first things I built so I ended up reacquiring one and restoring it and made the video about it and that got me started on my whole series of Heathkit test equipment videos and um, another one I did was a solid state uh, multimeter which I'd probably mention was another one I built but that one we never got working it just did not work properly and it turned out to probably be due to an error in the Heathkit manual that because we were in Germany we it wasn't so easy to just call up Benton Harbor and talk to a Heathkit engineer who might have immediately set us straight and so we tried to sort it out on our own and we didn't have the expertise to do it um, so I had that one. Another one, the only other one I could remember clearly building was this IG-18. So again, it has a nostalgic value to me. And that one did work well. Unfortunately, we didn't have any assembled oscilloscopes at that time, so we couldn't see the waveforms that it was generating. It was sort of academic. But anyway, so I've got an IG-18 now, and now I'll continue with the tour. Okay, I'm going to try to hold the camera steady with one hand here. So here's the front panel of the IG-18. It's a fairly decent looking panel. I always thought that the design of this period of Heathkit equipment at least had a good look to it. It looked like serious equipment. The, the uh, Heathkit Blue and Eggshell series that came out afterwards, I actually thought in many ways that looked nice too, but they did change some aspects of it, so it always looked just a little cheaper, uh, even though it was still a nice look. And I always respected this series for its industrial engineering. So let's look at the panel in close detail. We start out with an RMS voltmeter that's applicable only to the sine wave output. It has voltage scales from 0 to 3 and 0 to 10. And which scale you use depends upon uh, how you've got the output amplitude set up, which one's applicable. And you can also, assuming one milliwatt at 600 ohms, you can use the red scale to measure decibels directly. Power switch is here. I've already mentioned the switch that brings in an internal 600 ohm load it's using the internal 600 ohm load if the switch is up, if the switch is down, then it's assuming you've got an external 600 ohm load. Or you don't have a 600 ohm load at all and you don't care. These are the binding posts for the sine wave output. Here are the binding posts for the square wave output and also a ground lug which is just tied to the chassis in case you want to connect any of these terminals to chassis ground you can do it with this binding post. Here's a neon bulb that's the pilot light. Then we have the frequency selection which applies to both outputs. You've got a multiplier times 1 times 10 times 100 times 1000 and that applies to all three frequency control knobs. So for uh, units and for tens, you can select anything from 0 to 10. So I can go 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100, or 0 through 10. And then the vernier knob goes from 0 to 1, but because it's a potentiometer, not a switch, so it can be adjusted to any position. And so you end up with essentially a units, a tens, and a hundreds, and then multiply them by the multiplier, that is your frequency output. The sine wave amplitude is controlled by this one switch, which has quite a few positions. This tells you the RMS value of the sine wave. So you can go all the way down to 0 0.003 volts RMS to 0 0.01 to 0.03, you can see how it's alternating between a 3 full scale and a 1 full scale, then back to 3, 
and then 0.1, so it's a 1 again, and that's why we have the two scales here. Then a 0.3, then a 1 volt, then a 3 volt, then a 10 volt. So that gives you your output, and then there's the vernier knob, which is the central knob here, and assuming it's turned up to full clockwise, then the number here is fairly accurate, and you can verify it on the meter. I found that when the vernier knob is fully up, the output is slightly higher than it specifies. Instead of 10 volts, for example, it might be 10.1 volt. So the knob is ideally turned, you know, maybe just a little bit shy of that, but you're really going by what the meter says, not by what the knob says. So that allows you to go in between. For example, if you don't want 10 volts, but you don't want 3 volts, maybe you want 5 volts, you set it up to 10 and then turn the vernier knob down until the meter says 5 volts. With the square wave output, again the frequency is specified up here and it's done simultaneously with the sine waves. So you don't have to select one or the other. You can have both generated at the same time. The square wave is just generated off of the sine wave, so the sine wave is always present. Uh, you have an amplitude of 0.1 volts peak to peak, 1 volt peak to peak, or 10 volts peak to peak, and then there's the vernier in the middle, which again you can crank it down from whatever it's set to by the switch. And that's it. Let's take a look inside since the top's off anyway. All right, we have two circuit boards. There's a small circuit board. This is the power supply. And uh, I don't remember exactly what its output is, but I think it's on the order of 43 volts or something. And it's not a bipolar, it's just a unipolar supply. It takes three windings from the transformer secondary, rectifies them, filters them in a pi filter, so a resistor and two capacitors. Then there's a filtered uh, Zener regulator for a reference voltage. Then a medium power transistor with a heat sink. That's your actual pass transistor that converts the raw voltage into a regulated voltage according to the Zener reference. And that's your output right here. And then the circuit ground is the black wire up here. So very simple in that regard. This board is the generator board. This handles generation of the sine wave and generation of the square wave based on the sine wave. So we have some trim pots on here. There's a, uh, a meter calibration potentiometer. That's just for tweaking the accuracy of the voltmeter. There's a feedback pot that is used for the oscillator circuit. There's a symmetry pot. This is for deriving the square wave off of the sine wave, and you use it to uh, make sure your square wave is 50% uh, duty cycle. In other words, equal amount of time ha on and equal amount of time off. So that assures that you have a square wave, not a pulse wave. And then there's a bias, which uh, is part of the oscillator circuit. So. Um, I'm assuming that since most of the transistors are over here, and then D there's one, two, three, four, five, I think that's all the transistors on here. Uh, three of those, well, I'm sorry, no. Yeah, there's these additional transistors over here. So I believe these are the transistors that have to do with generating the sine wave, and then these guys over here in the metal cans, one, two, three, are part of the Schmidt trigger circuit that turns the sine wave oscillator output into a square wave. There is a uh, small incandescent light bulb inside of a protective sleeve here which is clipped to the board and that is part of the oscillator. It helps stabilize the amplitude. The type of oscillator that's used here would normally have a tendency to run away amplitude wise unless there's some sort of an automatic gain control element 
to uh, stabilize the output amplitude. And using an incandescent light bulb was a standard technique at the time. So that's what that board is for. And now we have the multiplier switch really just brings in several capacitors of different sizes into the oscillator circuit and then the I'll call it the tens and the and the 100 switches just has a bunch of precision resistors that are brought in and they're in parallel with each other so one of those resistors will be selected actually I think it's a um, almost like a binary adder type of arrangement where the switches are added in or the where the resistors are added in combination you might add a uh, 2 ohm to a 1 ohm to get a 3 ohm and so on um, for all the different resistances required and the same exact thing is done for the other switch here so those two get wired in some combination per switch and then wired in parallel with each other and that gets wired in a sort of series parallel arrangement with the capacitors and finally uh, the double potentiometer here is the vernier and that gets wired in parallel with these resistors so all of the components that select the frequency are right here on the front panel they're not on the circuit board So here is the uh, underside. The bottoms of the circuit boards are visible. There is a fuse there done in the way that Heath liked doing them in this period. I always wonder if they were just too cheap to put a fuse holder on the outside of the case so you could access the fuse without having to take it apart. And they didn't even use a fuse holder on the inside. They had the kind of fuse where the a wire was soldered onto each end of the of the uh, fuse and then just terminated so you had to do unsoldering to replace the fuse their rationale was probably that once you built this thing the chances of the fuse blowing was pretty slim so um, why not just do it that way and save a few shekels so what do we have on the bottom uh, we have the power switch we have the internal external load switch and its load resistor which is not 600 ohms but the way it gets wired into everything else it ends up being 600 ohms and then we have the sine wave attenuator switch and the vernier pot not really that much on it but there are a bunch of carbon composite resistors in various arrangements on here the more, the more you look, the more you see. They just sort of seem to jump out of the woodwork. And that's actually just a whole bunch of voltage dividers. For every step on the switch, there are two resistors. And uh, so one pair of resistors is a voltage divider that produces the second tier attenuation. And then off of that one are another two resistors that further divide it down and that goes to the next position on the switch then off of that are two more resistors to further divide it down I'm not sure why they did it that way it seems odd to me but I'm sure they had a reason the electronic circuit doesn't know anything about the attenuator it generates the output at its full voltage and then it's just chewed down by these resistors and then finally applied to the the terminals here directly off of the switch the square wave output is right here and it goes into a similar but simpler uh, array of resistors and potentiometer as the square wave attenuator and then finally directly from that to the output terminals for the square wave and of course there's the power transformer it does have a dual primary so you can wire it up for 120 volt or 240 volt use depending where in the world you happen to be
All right, let's do a demonstration here. I'm going to set this guy up for 500 hertz. So I'm going to set it to 50 here and 0 here and 0 here. So 0, 0, 50. Um, and then by putting it on the times 10 multiplier, that's going to mean 500 hertz. I've got my internal 600 volt load in, um, connected by the switch. I have the banana connectors uh, converted over to a BNC and then through a BNC cable to my oscilloscope, which is right here. And let's turn this guy on. Well, we're getting some sort of an oscillation there. Let's adjust the amplitude. There we go. Got a nice, clean, fairly clean looking sine wave there. Distortion seems to be pretty low, just eyeballing it. It looks like it has a fairly symmetrical uh, waveform, nice rounded curves. It's not one of those slightly filtered triangle waves like a lot of pieces of equipment put out and tell you that it's a, a sine wave when it clearly isn't if you know what a sine wave looks like. And it doesn't have one of those arrangements where there's a distortion of the downslope that is then replicated on the upslope. So the whole thing has kind of a sine wave leaning to the right or leaning to the left look about it. This, just eyeballing, it looks like a pretty good sine wave, a fairly low distortion sine wave. So let's see, is this thing accurate? Well, first off, the meter here is telling me that I'm high. So I'm going to back off on the vernier until it gives me 10. So I should be at 10 volts RMS. Is that at all accurate? Well, to convert an RMS sine wave at least into peak to peak, I have to go and put in my 10 volts times 2.82 and that gives me about 28 volts peak to peak. Uh, let's see what I've got here. My scope is set up for 5 volts per division. So let me move the position down so that the bottom of the wave is right on a line and then I've got one, two, three, four, five point four. So five point four divisions times five volts per division is twenty seven. So pretty close. It's not dead nuts precise, but it's pretty darn close. Now how about the frequency? It should be 500 hertz. So let's adjust this guy over. Sorry for the reflections here. My scope is set to 0.5 milliseconds per division and from peak, top peak to top peak it's one, two, three, four divisions. So let's do the math. Four times 0.5 milliseconds, 0 0.002, and then we take the reciprocal of that, 500 hertz, right on the money. Let's uh, try going to something a little higher. I'm going to switch up to a times 100 multiplier. So let's uh, bring this over and crank the uh, sweep frequency up. Still everything's looking pretty nice there. So peak to peak is still four divisions. So four times, what are we on now? 50 microseconds. 50 microseconds. 
0.0002, take the reciprocal, and it's 5000 Hertz, which is right what we should have. Now I can make tiny adjustments to that by adjusting the vernier knob here. And let's see, we can see it happening here. So you can see the right one moving in. And then I can mess with the um, the units. So you can see the spacing getting smaller as I increase the frequency. And the waveform glitches a little bit because we're physically interrupting the signal briefly every time I move the switch one position. Now I can move the tens around so all of that seems to be working well the voltages are what we expect and uh, the amplitude is staying right about where it should be so I would say the sine wave section of this is working just fine Well, let's go through the uh, vertical attenuation. So we're already getting pretty small there. Everything's still looking pretty good at one volt peak to peak. Let's crank her down some more. 0 0.03 and now I'm getting a little glitchiness here the uh, amplitude is really small and we're susceptible to noise pickup here. I'm not using a shielded wire for part of this, but the waveform still looks good. We have lost a little bit of amplitude once we start, well, it, we should lose amplitude because uh, we're cranking way down here. Um, So it's getting pretty iffy down there, but the thing is still doing its job. I just can't view it cleanly anymore. Let's move the uh, leads from this side to this side and now I'm getting a squared off waveform there so let's bring this into the fold so to speak set my zero and my position this is all going to be above ground signals so I'll put my ground down at the bottom of the display alright there's the square wave and uh, we're selected down to a pretty small voltage here because this is 0.1 volt per or 0.1 volt peak to peak and we're looking at four divisions here and we're currently at 20 millivolts per division so it's reading a bit low I'm sorry no I'd inadvertently turned the vernier down so I've got it cranked up where it should be now. So let's re-evaluate this. So it's more like uh, 4.6. So with the 4.6 divisions and a 20 millivolt per division, it comes out to 0 0.92 uh, volts peak to peak, which is really close to the 0.1 that it's set to. Now let's go up to 1 volt peak to peak. And I'm going to have to crank the uh, vertical scale down here somewhat. There we go. We still have the same uh, vertical, so the voltage has not changed. And it's a fairly clean square wave. There's a little bit of a, a rounding off at the leading edges. Now let's go up to 10 volts. <clears throat> 
so the output has gone up ever so slightly. It's gone up to about 4.7 divisions. But that's not um, calibratable. That's up to the accuracy or the tolerance of the attenuation resistors that are uh, on the back side of these switches. And of course the frequency hasn't changed because it's running off of the same uh, sine wave generator that we've already verified is fairly accurate. So let's just go through the ranges here a little bit. That's uh, 500 Hertz. Pretty clean. Actually it's cleaner at the higher frequencies. At the relatively low 500 Hertz we had a little bit of distortion on it. Let's go up to the 1000 multiplier. Again, pretty clean. Nice square wave. And let's uh, verify the, um, the duty cycle. So we have two divisions on and two divisions off. Pretty close, so it's a very close to a 50% duty cycle, which it should be having the name square wave attached to it. So the square wave is also working just fine. Okay, I've got the repainted bottom on there with fresh 3M bump on feet, just like it would have had originally. All right, and here is the beauty shot. All right, let's take a look at the manual. This is a full copy of the Heathkit IG-18 manual, which I downloaded the PDF and printed out and bound. I have an order from Manual Man coming, but it seems to be delayed, so I decided to just go ahead and make my own. So, um, got the cover page, picture of the unit. Table of Contents, Introduction, the Heathkit IG-18 Sign Square Audio Generator has been designed for laboratory use as well as for service and testing. Sine wave signals are available between 1 Hz and 100 kHz. Low distortion, meaning less than 0.1% sine wave signals are available from 10 Hz to 100 kHz, so at the lowest uh, range is below 10 Hertz you get more distortion. The output is stepped from 0 .003 volts to 10 volts. These high quality sine wave signals make it ideal for such applications as testing audio amplifiers for gain and frequency response, as a signal source for harmonic distortion measurements, or as an external modulator for an RF signal generator. Square wave signals with a rise time of 50 nanoseconds are available from 5 Hertz to 100 kilohertz at output levels of up to 10 volts. These clean square wave signals can be used for checking frequency response in audio equipment or as a trigger for testing digital instruments. The sine and square wave frequencies are identical and the level of both is independently adjustable. Both signals may be used either simultaneously or independently. The sine wave output will operate into high impedance loads of 10 kilo ohms or higher in all output ranges or it will operate into 600 ohm loads in ranges up to 1 volt. The square wave output is designed to operate into loads of 2000 ohms or greater. Other features include a panel meter for monitoring the sine wave output, repeatable selection of any frequency, switch selected 600 ohm internal load, and all solid state circuitry for maximum reliability. All of these features combine to provide you with a versatile, accurate, and attractive signal source. It will be a valuable and useful addition to your laboratory or workbench. A little bit on unpacking. The manual is broken up into sections. The wave generator circuit board is first. So we have a parts list just for that and a pictorial of parts associated with that. How to identify 
different resistors, capacitors, potentiometers, diodes, and so on, transistors, hardware. And we have a nice fold-out page for that. Step-by-step -step assembly. They want you to mount the board to the chassis before assembling it, which seems kind of odd. But that's the way they want you to do it. And then we assemble the parts onto the board over several pages. Then we get to the power supply circuit board. Once again, it's in its own section. We start out with a very brief parts list and a simple parts pictorial for identifying the parts. Now they show a completely different heat sink on the transistor here than the one that's on the unit I have. And again, they have you mount the board first to the chassis and then mount the components on it. Then we make up a little bit of a wiring loom. And we jump to the switch pre-wiring. That's the switches on the front panel. So again, we have a bill of material, a parts identification sheet on a fold-out. And then we go through mounting the switch in backwards on the chassis so that it projects out for easier access and then later on after it's pre-wired it'll be swapped around to mount on the inside of the chassis. Relatively few components mounted on the switches. There's another pictorial. And then it talks about how to connect up the transformer wires to the power circuit board and run the small wiring loom between the circuit boards that gets power from one to the other. Then we go into additional wiring of the uh, frequency switches and the amplitude switches. Uh, the sine wave amplitude switch, wiring that up. Then we get to the chassis assembly. Once again we have parts list, flips over to more of the parts list, and then step by step uh, with a fold-out parts identification sheet which continues over there and another fold-out this is for chassis assembly and then we have uh, additional parts being mounted on the panel mounting various terminal strips and then wiring up the remaining objects on the front panel to the circuit boards. How to wire up the transformer for 120 or 240 volt AC. Mounting the knobs on the uh, shafts. A little bit more wiring on the bottom side of the chassis. And then we have uh, identification of the switches. Final uh, knob installation. This is for the dual knobs, the ones that have vernier knobs um, co-centric with the switch knobs. And then making up the small test leads. Tests and adjustments. Quite a few steps for adjusting the uh, various pots for the the best symmetry and accuracy of the waveforms. Final assembly. Just putting the top and the bottom of the case on. Then a comprehensive diagram of everything on the front panel. Operation few pages of that. Talks about how to calculate the values of and assemble uh, impedance matching pads that would be external to the unit. And then it talks about several different applications for the unit. Hooking it up to just a stage in a transistor amplifier to test its characteristics or a single stage in a vacuum tube amplifier
or just a uh, integrated amplifier where you're not testing any part of the circuit, you're testing the whole thing. Square wave testing and again some applications for that. Talks about using Lissajou uh, patterns to determine frequencies if you don't have a frequency counter. Uh, substantial in case of difficulty section. Specifications, couple pages of that. Then we get into the circuit description. First the sine wave generator and then the square wave generator and then the power supply. Circuit board x-ray views. Some uh, chassis photographs. Replacement parts price list. And then um, semiconductor identification chart which also gives some specifications. And then there's a detailed diagram for the notch filter which is what specifies the frequency of oscillation in the sine wave generator circuit. And this is broken out because it's it's a large diagram and would not fit on the main schematic. And then we finally end up with the fold-out main schematic. And that previous diagram is represented here by a simplified version of it. All right, let's look through the schematic in more detail to understand the circuit theory. So um, let's start with the power supply. And unlike some schematics, this one is fairly well drawn. I didn't see any advantage in, in redrawing it for the sake of this video. So we have the uh, AC coming in. There's a fuse. There's a power switch, which is discrete. It's not on one of the knob shafts. It's, it's a separate switch. Then you've got the dual primaries. Each one gets approximately 120 volts. For 120 volt AC, you wire the primaries in parallel, so they're both getting the same voltage, and it adds up to about 240 volts total primary voltage. Because one winding always has approximately 120 volts on it, the neon power indicator a lamp and its current limiting resistor are wired across one of the windings. And that holds true even if you've got it wired up for 240 volts, the neon is still across just one winding, so it's always seeing the same voltage regardless of the line voltage. Then we have a full wave center tap style rectifier here. So even though there's only the two diodes because the transformer is center tapped and the center tap is the uh, reference point in the circuit or the ground in this case, uh, you are rectifying it using both halves of the wave. So there's a pi filter here made out of two electrolytics and a resistor. Then we have a resistor and a Zener diode that produces a reference voltage. And then that's used to control the series pass transistor that actually regulates down the uh, voltage, the raw voltage here to the regulated voltage. Now this isn't a regulator in the sense that uh, it has any feedback, so I probably shouldn't call it a regulator, and neither does Heathkit. It's just a uh, voltage based on a reference, and it's going to hold that voltage pretty constant. The actual voltage is not that critical. Uh, and since the load doesn't change very much, this kind of circuit works, works just fine. A couple additional capacitors in there for extra stability. This is identified as the minus power supply output and the plus power supply output, but there is no ground reference in between, so it's not a bipolar supply, it's just a monopolar supply. Now I did make a little bit of a sketch here showing the basic sine wave generator circuit. It's based on a more or less classic, you know, it's not exactly like the textbook examples. It does not use a twin T notch filter, uh, 
Um, and by the way, this should be better, more accurate than a Veenbridge oscillator. It uses the notch filter in such a way in one of the feedback paths from the differential amplifier output such that it causes the oscillation to only occur at the frequency that the notch filter is actually trying to notch out. And then you have a feedback path that establishes the gain or the amplitude of the output and is often done in this type of circuit there's an incandescent light bulb in the feedback path such that if the amplitude gets too high then the current flowing through this increases and even though the bulb doesn't incandesce its filament does heat up just a little bit and that increases its resistance and that causes the current to be diminished and by doing so it's able to regulate the voltage of the oscillation which otherwise would probably change around quite a lot especially as you're changing voltages or frequencies. Um, now I did this just to simplify the basic layout. Uh, in reality this is just a generic differential amplifier and I went back and forth on considering which one of these is the inverting and which one is the non-inverting side. Normally the oscillatory feedback path is on the non-inverting so that's the way I've got it shown here and the amplitude regulation side is on the inverting part of the circuit so that's why I have it shown. Uh, but it does not use an IC amplifier here it uses a two transistor differential amplifier and the output is taken off of this collector and this is usually some sort of a reference voltage here and then this is an input and if you just treat it like that then this becomes the non-inverting input because whatever you put there it appears here with the same phase and the way this works just in a very abbreviated fashion is you've got two transistors both operating as emitter followers so whatever you put on the input appears at the emitter minus the base to emitter voltage drop but they both share a return path so if one conducts more than the other that influences what the other transistor is doing and in a situation like this if you're holding this at some reference voltage and you're producing something varying out here it passes through with some gain and appears at the collector here um, I won't go into any further than that, but that's that's the basic layout, and that's doing what this is showing. But there's also a power amplifier following this in reality, so I've shown that here. And the way this operates has some effect on whether this is an inverse of this or not. And I think that's why there could be some confusion initially about whether this is really treated as the inverting input or not. So I won't go into that here uh, other than to say there's also this sort of odd in my mind uh, feedback path here in what should be the positive feedback. Uh, this is like one half of a twin T notch filter. Two resistors and a capacitor to normally this would be ground. Uh, that would be if this was a bipolar supply operated amplifier but in this case it's hooked up to a reference or bias voltage instead of ground and normally what you'd have here in parallel with this is two capacitors and a resistor going to this same point but for some reason Heathcote thought they could get away with doing this with just one capacitor here instead of two capacitors and a resistor to ground whatever they did it seems to work okay um, as I said before because this is not operating on a bipolar supply that the amplifier needs to have a reference point that's somewhere in between V plus and V minus or, or what is really the circuit ground and so there is a, a voltage divider between V plus and ground which is across the power supply in other words uh, two resistors and a trim potentiometer that's the bias a filter cap to stabilize it 
and then that's applied to the point that would be ground if this was a bipolar circuit and it's also used through the um, feedback potentiometer to uh, act as what would be a ground reference over here again if this was I wish my computer would stop doing that right when I'm narrating <laughs> anyway um, so again if this was bipolar this would be ground and this would be ground down here but instead it's a point in between V plus and ground sort of an artificial ground for the operation of this circuit the end result being that coming out of here is a sine wave ground is actually down here and V plus is up here and the artificial ground is what goes through the middle of the sine wave that's the point above which and below which it it oscillates so let's find that same thing in this greater schematic here is the two transistor differential amplifier again it has uh, the two resistors from V plus up here it has the common resistor to circuit ground it has the output being taken off of the collector here and it has an input here and then this input is connected to a point on a voltage divider which is in turn influenced by the output of the bias control which as I described earlier is another voltage divider between V plus and ground that's brought in this way there's also something I didn't talk about before and that's a resistor between the two transistor bases and what that does is it limits the gain of this differential amplifier to something less than it would be if you didn't have that resistor there so it's just a gain modification modification <laughs> um, now the output here does not have enough power to drive the actual instruments output so we have here a two transistor complementary uh, drive type of amplifier like you'd see on small audio amplifiers and things again between V plus and ground there's a NPN and a PNP transistor and the base of this one is driven at a higher voltage than the base of this one because of the drop caused by the voltage drop of these two diodes and this point is in turn driven from this transistor which is what's driven from the output of this amplifier over here so the sine wave coming out of there gets amplified it gets applied to this transistor and to this transistor at a lower voltage and because once NPN once PNP this one conducts when you need to be pulling the signal up this one conducts when you need to be pulling the signal down and you end up with your amplified sine wave here and then there's feedback as I showed before and it goes back into the feedback pot like I showed and it does that through the incandescent bulb and it also feeds into the notch filter which is just components on the front panel it's not on the circuit board and again this is represented by the much more complicated reality so this is the actual notch filter like I said before there's going to be a capacitor let's look at what this looks like again we have a resistor and a resistor of equal values and a capacitor to the circuit reference ground or something else and then a capacitor across that whole thing so we have several capacitors up here which are across the whole thing then we have also one of these capacitors gets picked off and brought out to this point which is this capacitor here being brought out to this point and then we have the two resistors again these two made up of one or more resistors here one of one or more resistors here and one or more here and one or more here and also these potentiometers this is the the lowest 
um, order of magnitude uh, potentiometer that adjusts the the output. So these two resistors, which are always the same, and whatever resistors are added together here and here, these two will always be the same, and whatever resistors are added together here, they will always be the same, and they're always in parallel, adding up to essentially just two resistors. And then, like I said before, these two capacitors are picked out of this group of five capacitors by these switches. The um, one that's being called CY, that's this one down here, that would be represented here as um, whatever capacitor is between here and here, where CX, that's the, uh, the one that goes across, that's always the one between here and here, or here and here. So the way it works is you've got two contacts on this switch. One always connects between here and here, and one always connects between here and here. And because they're always in lockstep with each other, and the uh, CY one is always one higher than where this one is, and CY is always one order of magnitude higher capacitance. So if CY is 5 microfarads, then, or, um, yeah, 5 microfarads, then CX will be 0.5 microfarads. If CY is 0.5, then CX is 0 0.05, and so on, down until the lowest one is 500 picofarads. The resistors are done by adding together four resistors. You have a 10K, a 5K, a 3.33K, and a 2.5K resistor. Again, matching ones on both sides. And depending on which position of the switch you're in, for 0 hertz to 100 hertz, uh, these resistors are connected in different, um, different configurations. I actually mapped it out here. So, <clears throat> if you're on the 0 hertz position of that switch, then all those resistors are open. There's no connection to them. If you're in the 10 hertz position, you should have 10K, and it's just using the one 10K resistor. In the 20 hertz position, it should have a 5K resistance, and it's just using a 5K resistor. 30 hertz should be 3.33K, and it's using a resistor of that value. 40 hertz, it should be 2,500 ohms, or 2.5K, and it's using a resistor of that value. Now when we get up to 50 hertz, it's looking for 2,000 ohms nominally, and it gets that by putting the 2500 ohm in parallel with the 10k ohm, which does work out to 2k or 2000 ohms. 60 hertz should have 1670 by theory, and it's getting 1667 by putting a 5k and the 2.5k in parallel. For 70 hertz, it should be 1430, and it's getting 1428 by putting the 3.33k and the 2.5k in parallel. 80 hertz should be 1250, it's getting 1249 by putting 10k, uh, 3.33k, and 2.5k in parallel. 90 hertz should have 1.11k, um, and it's getting 1111 ohms by putting the 5k, the 3.33k, and the 2.5k in parallel, and finally for the 100 hertz position, it should have ideally 1,000 ohms, and it's getting that by putting all four resistors in parallel. So just to uh, confirm that, the feedback is taken from the output of the power amplifier stage, not directly from the uh, differential amplifier here. And that, of course, is the right way to do it. And uh, as I said before, this bias pot here is what creates the artificial ground that is halfway or some point between V plus and V minus. And everything that happens in the following stages is also based on that bias voltage.
that is why the signal can swing up and down uh, here even though circuit ground is here. Now here's a key point the frequency leaving the power amplifier goes through this series capacitance and then through a resistance to circuit ground. By doing that, that shifts the level. So even though the sine wave up here is operating at a, everything above ground, once it goes through this capacitor and then this resistor to ground, the signal at this point is truly above and below ground, so it's alternating in polarity. And this is the, uh, the fine amplitude pot here. It's the, the rightmost amplitude adjustment. And then it goes through here and goes into the uh, multiple stages of attenuation. Now this looks complicated, but what it really is is just a bunch of voltage dividers. So if you're in this position of the switch, you have a voltage divider made out of this resistor and this resistor and this resistor and some smaller portion of the voltage here is developed here and applied to this point on the switch so you can select the unattenuated except by this pot of course the otherwise unattenuated voltage here or a somewhat attenuated voltage here or an even more attenuated voltage here and then the output from that point or the voltage that point goes into another voltage divider here these two resistors and the further attenuated voltage is available here then the output of that point goes through another voltage divider and the center of that goes to here so those five voltages of various levels of attenuation are done from this gang of the switch but then the next gang of the switch feeds into the first five positions that are shorted together so the signal if you're in one of these five it goes through the, this, this next stage without getting further attenuated and continues on but if you're in one of these positions here now you're just continuing to use the attenuations from here and further attenuate it so another voltage divider fading to here from that another voltage divider feeding to here and from that another voltage divider feeding into the last position so it's a whole stack of voltage dividers and then the end result comes on out here and is applied to the red sine wave output terminal the black one is at circuit ground uh, there's also this uh, internal or external 600 ohm load and that is available any time when you're in any of the ranges except for the first two. So if you're in that position, then even if you turn this load on, uh, you, don't, you don't get that additional load added. And I think that's because the resistors that are already in the circuit up to that point make it moot. Uh, so that's the sine wave circuit. So to illustrate further how the uh, attenuation works out here and to clear up any confusion I caused by my stumbling around on it just a moment ago, I'm going to reiterate with my own sketch here. So here's the output of the amplifier, which again the signal is above ground. And then we go through the capacitor and resistor to ground, which shifts the sine wave down so it's centered around ground above and below ground we have the fine attenuator potentiometer here which influences everything else downstream and then we have this voltage divider comprised of four resistors to ground and we tap off the first interstitial here and that is going to give us our 10 volts peak to peak and that goes to the switch in the 10 volt position. And then we go straight off of that switch to the red output jack. So in that sense, the only attenuation we have is whatever we get from this pot and from this node on this voltage divider here gives us 10 volts peak to peak, assuming 
this is adjusted all the way up um, and then we get a somewhat more attenuated version of it from this point on the voltage divider and this time it's three volts peak to peak or we can pick off of this point where most of the voltage has been dropped up here and now we have one volt peak to peak to get lower voltages we divide it down again we have 1600 over 1100 uh, ohm voltage divider and that takes us down to 0.3 volts from that 0.3 volts another 1600 over 1100 gives us 0.1 volts from that another 1600 over 1100 gives us 0 0.03 volts and from that another 1600 over 1100 gives us 0 0.01 volts and finally a 1600 over 750 gives us 0 0.003 volts so that's how we get all those levels of attenuation starting with the the highest voltage up there and then tapping off and going out to the output now for the internal load if we're switched in to have one and here's the switch if it's in the external load position then nothing is added if it's in the internal load position now we add this 560 ohm resistor and it goes through this other gang of the switch which is only engaged in the lower uh, voltages so if you're in the 3 volt or the 10 volt range even putting the switch in here doesn't really add anything because it's out of the circuit and the circuit does the switch does go to ground so uh, if you're in internal load position on the switch but you also happen to be in the 3 volt or 10 volt positions it shouldn't really make any difference uh, now the meter taps off at the highest point of the first voltage divider and we come down here we have the meter voltage divider 680 ohm over the 1k ohm meter calibration trim pot and we pick off of that we go into a bridge uh, to ground so uh, we have a rectifier here so if you're on the positive half of the wave this diode's forward bias this one's reverse bias so this one is like it's not even there and we have this path here into the plus of the meter come out through this current uh, or this resistor which makes this meter act like a voltmeter even though it's really a milliammeter or a microammeter uh, so diode meter movement resistor to ground on the other half of the wave when it's negative this one is reverse biased this one's forward biased and now the current goes from ground through the resistor um, up through this resistor through the meter from plus to minus through this diode and out to the negative voltage that's out here so we get full wave rectification and um, the meter always sees the same current direction going that way and uh, it's scaled so that it either reads zero or it reads up to 3 or it reads up to 10 and of course it doesn't know because nothing here changes when you're making all these selections you just have to know that uh, when you have a signal of a certain amplitude here and it's being divided down and conditioned this way if you happen to be in a range where it's got a 3 in it then you can interpret where the meters at as being that many volts up to something ending in three if you're in one of those with a one in it 10 volts one volts 0.1 volts then you interpret using the other scale on the meter because everything here just alternates between threes and ones so the meter itself isn't reading the output it's reading the front end and then you assume that it's going to be that voltage because of this regular uh, series of um, repeatable voltage dividers. Now the square wave circuit just piggybacks off of the sine wave generator. It takes the sine wave and it squares it up. So we come right off the power amplifier here and instead of going through this circuit we go into a Schmidt trigger which is comprised of these two transistors and 
all of the supporting components. And a Schmidt trigger, of course, is uh, in this case acting like a comparator and it's going to say well the voltage is above a certain point so make the square wave output high or the voltage is below a point make the square wave low and when it transitions from one to the other it has a very abrupt switch a very fast switching action so the rise and fall times of the square wave are very very much vertical it's a very much like a snap action circuit so this is what converts the sine wave to a square wave. And there's a trim pot here, it's the symmetry trim pot. And all that's doing is establishing where in the sine wave, which remember is floating above ground, it's always above ground, it says at what point on the sine wave are we using as the basis for switching. And by doing that we can adjust the square wave to be very square, in other words 50% on, 50% off. If you adjusted this up or down a little bit, you'd get a, a wave that's rectangular but not square. So going back here in the sine wave circuit, the bias is important to get the sine wave centered around the appropriate point in the circuit so it doesn't clip at the top or the bottom edges. And then the feedback is adjusting the amount of feedback for the a proper amplitude and the symmetry trim pot is used to make sure you get a square square wave instead of a rectangular square wave or just a rectangular wave really because it wouldn't be square and then the output of that has a power amplifier which is just comprised of this one circuit and uh, this diode here is to make sure that this transistor is never subjected to negative voltages on its base and there's this uh, capacitive coupling in here and then this um, diode making sure we only have positive signals here and this transistor is acting like a switch where it's pulling the output up or it's not and it gets pulled down by this 400 ohm trim pot or it's a front panel pot actually going to ground so uh, the emitter is pulled low through this pot, the collector is pulled high through this resistor and depending on whether this transistor is on or off determines whether this voltage is high or low. And it's always above ground. This, From this point on you're not getting a signal that's alternating in polarity or anything. It's always above ground and low is ground and high is something close to V plus. So then we have just a simple uh, attenuator here. We have the fine attenuation that, as with the sine attenuation, is the first thing it comes to. And then after that, it goes into a three-stage switch attenuator. Once again, just like with the sine waves, we have a voltage divider. If you are using the least attenuated position, it goes straight through without the resistor dividers. If you're in the next position, it gets the output of this voltage divider and then the secondary voltage divider hangs off of the output of the first one and gives you your third stage of attenuation here so uh, minimum attenuation, some attenuation, lots of attenuation and that output goes through straight to the red uh, front panel jack for the square wave output and the black jack goes to circuit ground so you get your nice ground reference square wave here and then the uh, the green jack uh, is just going to uh, circuit ground. It's actually chassis ground. Uh, on this schematic when you have this triangle pointing down that is circuit ground. The ground symbol is chassis ground. So you only use this one if you want to have either this output or this output referenced to earth ground. If you don't use this jack then it's floating relative to earth ground. 